The year is 2012. The Twilight franchise is at its height, and the final movie is premiering in theaters. Call Me Maybe is a hit song, and it's the first time most of us are seeing those celebrities who we typically see on the red carpet or big screen appear in low-quality YouTube videos for the first time singing along to the lyrics. Gossip Girl and Pretty Little Liars had their big reveals this year, and it marks the end of a golden age for teen TV on cable networks. Taylor Swift has moved away from country and put out her first pop album with Red, and moms across America are flocking to theaters to see Fifty Shades of Grey. So I'm just giving you a kind of feel for what the year was, what the time was. This was the vibe of the time. Dude, that I'm I'm depressed now. I know, right? That was <laughs> a good me time. Back. Take me back. Don't call me maybe in Twilight. I know. I will never forget what he looked like stopping that car. <laughs> Life Sorry. was good. I literally went to Forks, Washington with my aunt. And instead of paying for the tour bus, she like followed it. She followed the tour bus behind in our car and they were trying to like lose us. And she was like turning <laughs> into all the driveways. Um, DIY. DIY, yeah. This was the vibe of the time. Lots of angst and black and white photos. The cool kids at school who also happen to be chronically online are spending less and less time updating their Facebook photo albums with pictures from sleepovers. What's going on? They haven't poked you back in weeks. Do you know what poking is? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. I'm so, not that young. Okay, yeah. Uh, did you see Pokes. they're trying to bring it back? Really? On meta? Or? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. my God. Um, they haven't updated their statuses, and they haven't liked any of your recent posts. Where are they? Well, they're on this new app called Tumblr, but you'll never actually find their profiles, and they will never tell you what they are. The most popular accounts were always the most anonymous ones. You take a peek over their shoulder during lunch to see what their feed looks like on this mysterious app. There you spot a beautiful woman with red hair and a flower crown on her head. She is singing sadly into the camera wearing a white dress and sitting on a throne. You don't get the music at first because it sounds nothing like what's on the radio, but you're fascinated. Her name, Lana Del Rey, and it stands out to you. Who is she? Today we will be doing part one of the Lana Del Rey effect. Hi, I'm Coco. Hi, I'm Nikki. And this is Share Your Screen. Welcome back. We are so happy to have you guys. As always, continue the conversation in the Discord. Um, tell us what other effect videos you want. And you can also let us know in the comments on our YouTube and you can subscribe. This one has been a highly requested long time coming. One of our most requested, I think. And it's our first part one, part two. Yeah, and I'm uh, really excited too because I, you're like a stan. Yeah. And I'm like a mild fan. Yeah. Like I enjoy some songs. <laughs> a so stan I, and a mild fan. Yeah, <laughs> we should coin that. <laughs> yes. Um, but like, I, so it's like, I'm excited. I think this is gonna be very educational for me. Yes. Yeah. And the thesis of the Lana Del Rey effect is one of my favorite things to say, which is the opposite of trendy is timeless. And why sometimes people who refuse to chase trends end up having way longer careers than people who do chase trends. And I think that's kind of what Lana Del Rey is known for. Yeah, because I mean, at its core, chasing a trend is trying to be like everyone else. And in order to truly be timeless, as yeah. you describe, you have to create some sort of lane that is uniquely your, yours yes. that draws people to you. Right. And I think that is like the this clinical difference between the two. Yeah. And like people aren't going to follow you if you're doing something that someone else is already doing, but like less better. Yeah. You know? or, 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 I mean, even if they do, it's like empty fame. Yeah. Cause again, it's not based in a specific piece of like value that you're giving this right. person. Exactly. So in this episode, we are going to go into her start and kind of her like underground rise and then we're going to end part one at her SNL performance, which to this day has been like highly talked about, highly contested. And then in part two, we're going to talk about her um, ability to kind of still bounce back from this SNL performance and have her first Coachella performance to now her headline of Coachella 10 years wow. later. Yeah. So that will be part one and part two. Now, part one, did you know that her first stage name, one of the few that she was considering was Sparkle Jump Rope Queen? <laughs> uh, I'm glad we crossed that one off the drawing board. Yeah. I think Lana Del Rey works a little bit better. Yes. I can't imagine Sparkle Jump Rope Queen like singing about heroin and cigarettes. I know. Like, I can't imagine like her jump roping on stage with like a sparkle jump rope. Like I wonder no, like what but do you the... remember Jump In the Disney movie? Oh my god, yes. And they were what like doing like handstands. 
the way I tried to learn how to double dutch no. jump rope for like a month and my forced my mom to like sit in the driveway oh, and like, wait, like do it. Corbin Blue was like the one in it, Corbin right? Blue. Yes, I remember that. Now, Elizabeth Grant is her name, and she was born in New York City. After graduating high school, she moved to Long Island to live with her aunt and work as a waitress. During this time, her uncle taught her to play guitar, and she said, I could probably write a million songs with those six chords. So that's really where her love for music came from. That's so cool. Yeah. She began playing in clubs around New York City under stage names like Sparkle Jump Rope Queen and Lizzie Grant. She was getting kind of an underground following, but she had even said at the time it was more just like her and other underground artists just like sh supporting each other, yeah. um, really trying to break through. And in 20, 2007, she signed to an independent label and they gave her just $10,000, which That's like crazy. Yeah. And she used that money to move to a trailer park in New Jersey and she did at this time, though, catch the eye of the producer, David Kahn, I believe is how it's pronounced. You guys know me and, oh my God, pronunciations. But she liked him because he was interested in making music that wasn't just pop. And I think okay. that's like kind of a thesis of her entire career. Yeah. Is making music that isn't what's currently popular. Right. And even in her earlier is when she was making more poppy music, mm -hmm. it was very anti-pop. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, now she put out a self-titled album, but by 2010, she met two managers that would help her get out of her record deal at five point records. The ones that gave her just 10 K Okay, because she said not much was happening there. Yeah, I assume. Yeah. And I think that seems to be a common trope with a lot of artists. Half the battle is like, yeah, making good music. So much of it, though, is luck and ha getting the right team and the label behind you. Yeah. I mean, especially at, at this point, because this is right before the era of like where self-publishing really takes mm -hmm. off. Like YouTube really starts to hit its peak and like 2015, Spotify gets popularized in America. Mm -hmm. 2015, um, at, at this, we're in 2010s. There yeah. is no way to just make a song and put it out there besides like tumblr like soundcloud and, if you're lucky and like my like some people got music careers off yeah. myspace but it wasn't built for that mm -hmm. they were never like taken seriously even later in their right. careers if they started on myspace yeah. in 2011 and like you always say in your videos too it takes 10 years to be an overnight success so she signed her first record deal like four years before she even was recognized by the label that would actually end up signing her and taking her. So it was like mm -hmm. five years of playing at these small clubs, living in a trailer park in New yep. Jersey, just hoping that she'll get noticed, yep. changing her stage name a bunch. Um, and so she, in 2011, signed with Interscope Records, where she still is today. And she geared up to release her next album, Born to Die. And this would be the album that changed everything. Yeah, this album changed everything. Yes. And the first video in like music video that got attention online that put her on the radar was for her song Video Games. And she even said in an interview that they weren't even considering making that the first single. But did you know that her and her sister, Lana Del Rey and her sister, created the music video for video games using a laptop webcam. Interesting. Yes. She filmed clips of herself and then grabbed like archived clips online of skateboarders and hotels. And she put these clips together to create the music video. And on YouTube, it has amassed 341 million views. And it's thought to be one of her breakout moments. That's crazy. And it comes at a time where in 2011, so many, like what was popular, again, Lana Del Rey is the like epitome of taking what's popular and doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. We were coming out of a year of highly produced, big budget music videos. You had um, California Girls by Katy Perry. Mm -hmm. You had Love the Way You Lie with Eminem and Rihanna with these cars on fire and these big sets and all these cameras in production. And Lana Del Rey was able to pierce through all of that noise and budget yeah. with a video that she filmed with her sister on an old laptop webcam. Yeah. That's power. It is. And I there's two things that like interest me. One, I think it's it's, it has a lot to do with like having, I think, a clear vision and brand as an artist. Like we, I feel like we really talked about this in the Selena mm -hmm. episode a lot where the people who 
do the best and have the longest careers just have a very good understanding of like where they are in the landscape yeah. so like lana understood that like yeah what's popular is these really grandiose very hyper pop 2010 to 2015 hyper pop you think mm -hmm. teenage dream and Katy perry like that whole album yeah. super poppy um lady gaga lady just gaga dance. yep like mm -hmm. and she i think understood that it's like She's not that, mm -hmm. therefore the music video should not be that too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it needs to be skateboard, like dirty yeah. skateboarders and like, cause that was like the brand she that was, was building. And even if it, I mean, she, it did end up being super popular, but even if it wasn't, it's more important to be in line with yeah. like wherever your community is mm -hmm. in this like vast world of music. Yeah, it was, you're so right. It was her. And it kind of reminds me of when we talked about in the Tate McRae episode, how one of her breakout songs, You Broke Me First, she filmed it by taping an iPhone to the back of a car and walking through her hometown just with the camera, you know, facing her, just yeah. walking slowly. And it was how she got recognized and has a career now because of that. It's that scrappiness. Interesting. I have a theory as to why every artist's first album or like first music video is always their best. Why? And I think it's because it has something to do with it's like the only time they ever truly create art with no expectation of it being consumed. Yeah. Like sometimes it gets like, I think of like a sour by like Olivia Rodrigo, like the thought process that went into writing that album versus guts is like guts has to live up to sour. Sour was like a girl in a, her hometown bedroom after pandemic. Yeah. And that I think is like a magic that can only happen once. It can only happen once in any career. You think of Lana and again, like talking about like born to die, born to like die. it's, these songs are so good when mm -hmm. it's and feels like so uniquely them when they don't expect anybody to to listen to it yeah because then there is like this no holding back or what are they gonna mm -hmm. think or is this commercial enough or can i sell this yeah. can i go on tour for this blah 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 that is like not even in their brain it's like just mm -hmm. the music and i think that that is like such a beautiful thing that happens yeah i don't know it's such a good point there's no excel sheet of someone being like are you gonna make this money back of yeah. like the budget exactly yeah totally and i remember her video games music video was the moment that I found her <clears throat> as a teenager on Tumblr. I remember seeing this like mysterious woman in this Giphy that just kept like replaying and she had this big red hair. And I almost thought maybe she was, it was a clip from like an old Hollywood film. And then I started learning about who Lana was. This is huge numbers for her song video games. It peaked at number 91 on the billboard chart. So it's not a very high peak, but the fact that the video got 341 million views and it wasn't even in the top 10 yeah. of the billboard charts upon its release is it just shows kind of this, she was building this cult like fandom that really I think goes against what's like in popular mm. culture and like the status quo. And I think she's always had this like underdog effect. Always, mm -hmm. even at the Grammys this year, which we'll talk about, yeah. we saw she was still this like underdog. Now in January of 2012, she was gearing up to release her debut album under the name Lana Del Rey, which would be titled Born to Die. So that video game song was the first song that she put out from this upcoming album. Again, they didn't think it was gonna be a single or even really be that popular. I think yeah. she just released that music video on YouTube just for fun and it just took off. Because of the success of the song video games and the video, the music video, she was then booked to perform SNL two weeks before the release of this kind of debut album under this new label. Now, whoa, yeah, I didn't realize how early this was in her career. Very early, she performed SNL. So this very is early. For interesting, almost set up before, to fail in a way. Yeah, because I feel like now, like you don't get SNL unless something's really happening for you. Right, right, and yeah. it's so yeah, it's it's like a a it, it's a huge point in people's careers that mm -hmm. really makes or breaks them. I mean, you think of Ashley Simpson's career completely tanked because her backtrack on SNL repeated and then it was seen that she was lip syncing and everyone lip syncs now, but her career, she never mm -hmm. had a career after that because of the fiasco That's of Ashley crazy. Simpson lip syncing on SNL. Lana Del Rey's performance would be highly criticized by critics. I think they didn't really like understand her. She had this melancholy demeanor and it was something that was very opposite of what was expected of pop stars at the time. You had mm -hmm. Lady Gaga doing the splits and like hyper pop and, you know, Katy Perry in these blue wigs and very like these caricatures and Lana Del Rey, while a caricature herself was kind of the opposite of what they thought you should be, I think. Mm -hmm. And so she had 
I mean, this performance is still a pain point in her career. There was a rumor, I don't know if it was ever confirmed, but the Grammys that just happened a few months ago, and she was really, like, for the first time, there was, people thought that she could potentially win Best Album mm-hmm. of the Year. And she it went to Taylor Swift instead. And, uh, you know, there was a rumor that one of the Grammy judges anonymously said that, like, they'll never consider her seriously after the SNL performance, which happened 10 years ago. That's If that's true, that's ridiculous. I know. Imagine making a mistake. I don't even think her performance is a mistake, but like just to put it into context, imagine a mistake you made, like me as a barista at 16 at like right. Starbucks, like being why I wasn't given a job that I've worked 10 years for. Right. Or it also is just, it, I think it bothers me that somebody could have the mindset that, oh, they did this thing bad 10 years ago. They are incapable of improving. Right. In a decade, there is no conceivable way they could have ever improved their skill. Like yeah. failure is a part of success. Yeah. Like you it's literally, fail you fail until you learn and then you don't do it anymore. Yes. So that annoys me if that's true. Right. And something funny too about Lana is that she hadn't really told her parents she was pursuing music seriously until she was on SNL. And she's like, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. By the way, mom, mom, tune in. Yeah. Mom, turn on your TV Saturday yes. night at 9 p.m. Right. I got a surprise for you. And I think it also shows how early, even though she had been performing in these underground clubs and different uh, stage names and stuff, it really did show, though, how early in her career that she had been finding success that she was then put on SNL. I think that it was like it kind of happened very quickly after her YouTube video blew up. online. Yeah. And it's so interesting. I don't know, as someone who's like not super familiar with Lana Del Rey, like I think of her as this very not online person Mm -hmm. and that's what she's known for but it's interesting to see that her roots are entirely digital like entirely online it i you're right she's so mysterious she doesn't do a ton of interviews Mm -hmm. which is even doing this um research was hard because even as a super fan she really doesn't talk that much about and i think that's part of her mystique but i think she's like a silent lurker. I think so too. Because she was at this Billboard Women's in Music award show and she was like leaving out of one of the backstages and these two vloggers that I love, Remy and Alicia, yes. were like in the little area and she comes outside and she's like, I watch your vlogs. I would die. Oh, I would die too. I know. I would bring the fuck out. So like she definitely I think is like a lurker, but she is someone that doesn't like post a lot or like yeah. do interviews a lot. Yeah. Now, despite harsh critics of her SNL performance, even SNL with Kristen Wiig did a bit the following week. Like I think kind of standing up for her, but also kind of making fun of her. Wait, when did this happen? At, on SNL, the week after Lana performed, they did a whole like sketch about That's her. That's mean. Yeah. That's just mean, dude. I like, th- yeah. It's somebody who's just new to music. You don't need to, like, they already feel bad. You don't need to harp on it. Kick someone while they're down. Exactly. So fans really did show up two weeks later, though, when her album came out. And I believe her album, Born to Die, really starts to cement her in pop culture history. It charts at number one in 11 countries and charted at number two in the U.S. Later that year, she would then release the Paradise EP, which is like the cover where, so the Born to Die, she has the curly red hair and the blue sky and like a white shirt. Mm -hmm. And then the Paradise EP that came out later that year, she has like long straight red hair and it's a more tropical. And it would be her second album to chart on the US top tens. And a common theme that we're going to notice in this episode is that Lana Del Rey puts out not just songs, but albums. I was literally going to say exactly that. Machine. Like that Beyonce quote where it's like, it's no they one makes albums album. anymore. Lana could not really, like she holds she, it down. I feel like almost like her albums are better than the songs, which doesn't make right. sense, but it, it they're like, collective. She ha- yes. Like it's like very a uh, holistic vision. She's yes. very good at that. And a lot of artists today are not. A lot of artists put out singles to see how they're doing and then craft yeah. eventually an album yeah. around it. Like for example, a great person to kind of compare the way that people get famous now is I Spice, who we love and we've seen live. She, I don't think has even put out an album yet. And no, she's like, you know, collaborating with Taylor Swift. She has her album coming out Y2K, but I, it really shows that like Lana is an album artist. And that's, I think very rare now. People don't put out albums like that. No, it's completely rare. And I think that the way that like short form content works has has made it even worse. Right. Because now it really incentivizes a quick hit. Yes. In ways that was never before. Whereas 
like this radio era, you could make an album and then you submit the album and the radio picks whatever song whatever they song. like the most off the album. Yeah. So there's pros and cons to all of it, but it is really interesting to think about that. Yeah. And even now there's even this like, like hyper quickness of singles where now it's not even about people putting out a single anymore. It's about people curating 15 seconds of a song and then writing the rest of the song. Yeah. Seeing after that went viral. Like you think of kind of the flop of Jack Harlow's G L A M yeah. where like that 15 second snippet so was good. great. And then it was like the rest of the song clearly didn't feel really thought out. Right. And maybe and it was, but it didn't feel like it. Well, I just think it wasn't good. Like the yeah. verses on that song were just not that good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know what's interesting because some artists are like really good at that. Like, I really think one of the the best things the like Doja Cat is so, no artist has done it like Doja Cat. Where like I remember, do you remember when like Kiss Me More just had like a chokehold over the forty page? Yes. Like twenty twenty one summertime, twenty 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 one summertime. That song was so viral because I remember there were so many like trends about it, like all the but they were and... all different. Right. Yeah. So there was like the, you know, like thing, know that I remember people did like the yep. gay trend, but then there was a dance trend and then yes. there was the Doja Cat rap first. And then there was a trend where it was the SZA chorus and stuff. And I was like listening back to that song. If you listen to it, the, it changes like every 30 seconds. I know. It's like the tempo changes, the beat changes. Now SZA comes in, now Doja comes in to rap. Now they're harmonizing, now they're not. And that type of writing is like so good for TikTok. For TikTok, yeah. But I think if you're not good at it, don't do it. Yeah. Like th like Doja's really good at <laughs> it. Good she at knows it. how to yeah. like do the quick hits and stuff like that. But then you're right, like talking about a Jack Harlow where it's like, yeah, you can use like the little cute Fergie thing, but yes. if you can't live up to it, it's not worth it. Exactly. Yeah, you're sorry. Doja's so good at that. And I think Doja also really got her start online. And I think she understood those like 15 second moments yeah. in a way. And like that translates in her artistry. Yeah. Now, 2013 is when Lana Del Rey would secure her first Grammy nomination. And it was always like kind of these subcategories. So it was for best pop vocal album. And then she would collaborate with Baz Luhrmann to create the soundtrack song for The Great Gatsby, one of my favorite Lana Del Rey songs, which is Young and Beautiful. This is really interesting. Young and Beautiful went out and it started trending, but then her label would prematurely decide to pull it off the radio. I didn't know how this works, that they can like tell the radios like, actually we're not gonna play that anymore. And they took a risk and they sent a different song to radio instead. It would be, a Cedric Gervais remix of her song, Summertime Sadness. Now this was thought to be, why are they pulling this young and beautiful? It's gonna be a part of you. It ended up being a really good call because that Summertime Sadness remix is truly what pushed Lana Del Rey yeah. to become a massive household name. Yeah. Truly. And so it's this interesting, you know, decision that they made behind the scenes. And I remember that Summertime Sadness remix. Like I was always a fan of her, but it felt like it was the first time someone took something and like kind of made it attainable to people that maybe didn't understand her already. Yeah. But it so it charted at number six on the billboard. And it would really set her up to have these like just pivotal next few years. And something I want to add about Lana Del Rey that I really think is so fascinating. She reminds me of Frank Ocean, not just that they both kind of got their fame and mm -hmm. starts on like having these Tumblr fandoms, but Lana Del Rey doesn't change her music to fit like what's popular. Like yes, Summertime Sadness was this remix someone else did, but Frank Ocean, he had his song Pyramids in the start of his career yep. that was really taking off. And it was a six minute song over six minutes and labels and radio stations were like, okay, great. You're taking off. We will play your song on the radio if we can cut it down to under three minutes. Mm -hmm. And Frank Ocean said, no, you either play the song in its entirety or don't play it at all. Yeah. And I think that also cemented Frank Ocean in this like cult-like following. And I think Lana is very similar that mm -hmm. she's not really going to change herself yeah. to what's popular. Yeah. And I think you think of them as like the, like people are really like artistry. Yes. You know, like really, really think about that. They're not like a, a commodity, a, a they're commercial artists. success. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because I do think that that, that doesn't come without risk right. and it doesn't come without pain. Like, like I remember there was like an interview with Frank Ocean a long, long time ago where they were, he was like talking about how much money he's made in music and people were shocked at how low it was. Mm -hmm. And it's 
because he like doesn't go on tour, which is how they make their most money. He doesn't do press, yeah. he doesn't promote, blah, blah, blah. And he's talked about that. He was like, this is like, I remember, I think he said like in the beginning, it was like something that was like really turmoiling over, but he realized mm-hmm. it was like, I, that's not what I want. Yeah. Like if I can't do the music my way, then like I just, it's not satisfying to me. Yeah. So he's like, I just, you just, I realized I just have to be okay with less money. Yeah. And I was like, wow, like that's an interesting way to think about it even of like, I'm going to literally essentially trading money for like creative freedom. And like maybe if Frank Ocean had kind of succumbed and done what everyone else was doing and going on tours and stuff, we would have maybe never gotten the album Blonde yeah, because he would have been too tired and like not himself. And like Blonde is probably going to be seen as like one of the best albums of this century. I think it is. Like truly defining the century. I remember when there was like a TikTok trend where it was like, like, what do you think is, like, a perfect album? Like, name, like, five that you think is, like, not you just you like, but is, like, perfect, like, holistically perfect. And I think Blonde was, like, one of the ones that yeah. instantly popped in my mind of, like, yes. it's just so many songs on that. And it's so fascinating, like, if there's some sort of, like, sociologist that doesn't have more serious and pressing things to study, if they <laughs> can take on trying to understand what it is with these kind of, like, eclectic underdog artists like Tyler, the creator, Lana Del Rey, Frank Ocean that build these cult like fandoms on Tumblr. Like it really was just this breeding ground. I think some of it too is like, like Tumblr was this very anonymous profile. And so Mm -hmm. they really liked artists that weren't in it for like the ego yeah. and the branding. And so people really latched onto artists that were doing it for the artistry and not the commodity, like you said. Mm-hmm. So there's just an interesting, uh, you know, thing here. And now, so 2012 and 2013 were just like these really pivotal years for Lana Del Rey. While she became a household name, she would still really be seen as this like underdog in the industry, which I think we still see today, even at the Grammys Yeah, with like her going on stage with Taylor Swift. And it was really this like stark visual symbolism of someone that the industry has propped up. And then someone kind of in the shadows who has a similar trajectory and fame, but the industry never really like props up in the same way. And other thing about Lana too, is that she kind of reminds me of, um, so she kind of reminds, this is going to be such like a random comparison, Remember when we did the Emma Chamberlain episode and we were comparing her fame to Tana Mojo's Mm -hmm. and how like Emma Chamberlain, that kind of feels like Taylor Swift and Lana Del Rey, where it was like Emma Chamberlain was Very different vibes, but I get what you mean. By the industry where like Emma Chamberlain was plucked by these people at YouTube. Always. And put front row at the Louis Vuitton show to be the poster child of YouTube. And Taylor Lorenz talks about it in her extremely online book and that Tana Mojo had a similar following and- I mean, for, again, like decisions that she at times made in her career and is paying the price for, but was always shunned by these publications that did not want her to be famous. And yet she still like prevailed regardless. And it's, um, it's an interesting thing because I think it's so much of like, when something like that happens, it's what they want to succeed and what is like easy for them to succeed. Right. Right. It's like YouTube, it's very easy for that. She's very, she's a young girl. She's very Mm -hmm. brand safe. She's relatable. She doesn't really do anything that's not monetizable. Yeah. And uh, so because of that, they are like, oh, let's really rally around this girl to right. put uh, Louis Vuitton and then host the Met Gala and all yeah. that. Uh, Tana is the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like someone like a Taylor and Lana, even you think like Taylor's with very safe commercial music. Yeah. Very kid friendly, very adult friendly, can cross generations. Lana, not like that at all. Yeah, right? not kid friendly. Like, like, She's not like smoking friendly. a cigarette on stage. So, yeah, yeah, talks about stuff like that. Like, um, so she will be seen more as this artist amongst the fans, right. but never can get that like industry recognition mm-hmm. of just raw commercial success. Yeah, because it's not playing into like what works for them. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, and I think the reason too that I attached myself to Lana was like. I've always felt, and maybe it's not all, like, I think that I've been very lucky and chosen in a lot of ways, but like, I always felt whether it was like in school um, or in, you know, even in my career that like, I would work hard, but I was never like the one that was, you know, the face of things or like invited to red carpets or 
doing things that I would love to do that you kind of need this co-sign from these big brands to be mm -hmm. able to do. And I always felt like I was the one that was like kind of looked over, but I still had this almost like cult, like follow, not like cult, like following, but I have this like audience that rallies for me. And I think sometimes brands don't always know that or see that. And I think I miss out on a lot of things as a result. And so I look at Lana as kind of, I, I never like was able to articulate that until I saw her live last, like uh, last year. And I was just like, I literally started crying. Cause I'm like, Oh, like I don't have to be like the Taylor Swift or the Ariana Grande. Like yeah. I can be like the Lana of yeah. my industry and that's exactly. okay. Um, and it was like this kind of comforting thing that I was like, and, and I think when talking about like building a community in music, like yeah. that's what she, it, that's who she appeals to. Right. Yes. So, like it, there, uh, there's a million, there's more people out there who aren't chosen for things and there are people yes. who are, yes. you know? So like, if you only make music about the hot, be positive things, like she was really, and I think just think about Tumblr as a platform, yeah. like Tumblr was really known for this like angsty anti-meta outcast, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. that was the kid who was on Tumblr yeah. in 2012 when f when all their other friends at high school were on Facebook. Yes. And those are the type of kids who are going to get drawn to a Lana Del Rey. Yes. So I think that, like even what you're describing of like your personal so experience true. is probably something that other people, maybe not in the exact same See. way, but like in the, have like experienced some sort of similar, like I don't feel like I was like seen or chosen mm -hmm. and this artist is not seen or chosen, but I really like her music. Therefore it resonates with me in that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good way to put it. Like I always think like like pay attention to who your role models are because they're like a reflection of where you're headed and like your future. Yeah. And so I'm going to end this episode talking about her first Coachella because it was so fascinating reading this one article written by a billboard journalist who was present in the crowd and they kind of foreshadowed a play by play of what would then happen with Lana's career over the next 10 years. And it was so accurate. I was reading it last night. I'll link it below. And I was like, whoa, this is so crazy. So Coming off a successful two years, Lana Del Rey was then booked to perform at Coachella for the first time in 2014. Billboard, a journalist from Billboard, was present in the crowd, and they called it a star-making performance. They wrote, Lana Del Rey inched further from memories of her unsure footing as an artist, i.e. the SNL debacle, and closer towards undeniable pop stardom. Wow. And so they really mark this performance at Coachella as kind of the antithesis of what the SNL performance was, mm -hmm. and that she was really showing that she actually was here to stay. And so many people I remember during the SNL performance said like, all right, your 15 minutes of fame is over. Like yeah. they kind of thought that she just got lucky to end up here. And and in the performance at Coachella, she lights a cigarette on stage as fans sing the course to summertime sadness. And the journalist even notes that she kind of she had this really like relaxed demeanor, like she was really doing what she was meant to be doing. And she even asked kind of to no one in the crowd, but like, am I allowed to like this? Like, you know, she has this very like yeah. playful energy with crowds when she's performing. And again, something only she could pull off. I, I don't think I can see Ariana Grande or Taylor Swift lighting a cigarette on stage no, and no, it going couldn't. over well. Yeah. <laughs> like it just wouldn't. Um, and so even after the performance, again, I think another symbolism of something she's so great at, which is that she had been shunned by the industry. And so her power was really in her fandom. And after her performance, she walks off the stage and she's greeting fans at the barricade. And she even placed a pink flower crown on a girl's head, which is so like symbolic of the time, just these flower yeah. crowns. She, she really popularized and that she always just seemed really thankful for her fandom and that her fans really saw her potential when the industry didn't. And then that year she would just go on to have another huge, which we'll get into in the next episode, which is really where now her albums that she starts putting out, which is a lot of them really start like sell she's able to sell physical copies of CDs and albums mm -hmm. that other pop artists weren't able to sell these physical copies. That's a really interesting yeah. thing to think about. And I think it is like, again, her fandom is like this kind of like aesthetic, this maybe like this more artsy kind of staying yeah. at home kid where they have the vinyls on their yeah. wall. Yeah. Make and it's also fascinating to think about because this is 2014 and 2014 is actually the lowest amount of money the music industry has ever made. Yeah. Like the, the music industry crashed this year. It was- uh, With the rise of streaming and- It was yeah. right before, it was when CDs were dying out still, mm. but uh, streaming hadn't become good yet. Yeah. So it's like Napster and LimeWire, <laughs> but like not 
Spotify No one yet. making money. Not Spotify yeah. yet. And that is so interesting even to think that she could have success in a time like that is another yeah. thing to speak about the power of the fandom, I think. Yeah. And it was like she had this power and wasn't, besides Summertime Sadness remix, wasn't like getting any radio play. And she was still able to churn out these album sales that are like yeah. unmatched at the time. Yeah. I mean, maybe Frank Ocean was also selling similarly, but it's just really cool to see. Like, I think this portion of the episode is a reminder that you can have moments in your career that feel ending and yep. like everything has crumbled. Yep. But if you really just stick to your craft, like I think I'm a big believer that no matter what mistake you make in life, like we are put on earth to do certain things. Each mm -hmm. person has like a certain thing that they are really meant to achieve. And there's no mistake that you can make that's going to deter that from happening. Maybe it'll delay it a little yeah. bit, but like, I think she's a great case study in that. Interesting. I love that. Um, yeah. Somebody commented on one of my videos recently. Um, your success can never be delayed only, only de or your success can never be denied only delayed. I love that. And I was like, that's such a good quote. Yes. It's so like Lana Del Rey, like she really put in the work. Yeah, It's like nobody can, the only person who can ever deny you from something is you because you stopped trying, yes. but they can delay it. They can say no, but that doesn't mean everyone will. You know right. what I mean? So. Totally. So we will see you guys in the next episode, which is going yes, to be I'm part so two. We did first part two. Yes. And um, around the time this is going to be going up, I believe it's like Coachella will be then happening the following week. So if Nikki and I go, like we will let you guys know and say hi to us. If you see oh us. Oh my God, please. Please say hi to us. Please, we please, love it. Please, we do. Yeah. We actually really genuinely do. And that we, goes for all things, not just at Coachella. Yes. If you ever see us on the sidewalk or anything, we love talking to you guys. I feel like our audience is just so brilliant and I love talking to them because I like know, the too. conversations we have, like, I'm like, wow, like we've got a smart bunch. <laughs> <laughs> a <laughs> smart know? bunch. Yeah. I love it. Um, well, don't forget to subscribe guys. Subscribe. Give us some ratings on Spotify, please. Yeah. And turn on the notifications so you know when the part two episode goes up. Yep. And we'll see you next week. Bye.